We continue this evening with a look back at 16 years of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. The host of the nightly Comedy Central show announced in February that he would leave the program. The finale is airing tomorrow night. Here is a look at what Jon Stewart and other guests on this program have said about The Daily Show over the years. What do you enjoy the most about it? When, when it feels relevant. Yeah. When you feel like the, the uh, uh, anger or the, the humor that you would feel in something that most of the people in the country have some idea of and some opinion of, and you can get it out there that night, yeah. then it, it feels really relevant, and that's the most enjoyable thing in the world. During the lead-up to the war, and certainly in the beginnings of the war, um, you could argue that some of the best news was coming out of that comedy show. Sure. They, they were actually bringing up issues that weren't being talked about in other places. Are they only getting their news from John? Well, the problem is that's not John's fault. That's saying that there's a lack somewhere else of, of, of real information. I know something about his politics in terms of I, I know something about comedians' politics. Right. They, they tend to be iconoclasts, yeah. and they tend to be uh, anti-status quo. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of comedy is about tearing down status or status shifts. And so right. uh, I think he's probably not a big fan of authority. But John is um, admirably balanced, you know, however people may characterize him. Every time I ever work with him on something, and I, and I wrote with John a lot when I was over at The Daily Show, he tried to perceive what was the uh, true intention of the person speaking left or right, whether or not it was something he agreed with, because he wanted to be able to honestly mock. Oh, I think he's one of the most important voices in, in information mm -hmm. in this country. Just because he delivers it with a comedic point of view doesn't diminish it in any, its importance in any way. The audience often look to John to make them, to help them uh, articulate very complicated, painful feelings. And something like the Trayvon Martin verdict would be a moment where I could feel in the audience people are looking to John. Once you establish a rhythm of how you do the show, you have to work harder to evolve it and to, you know, to constantly try and improve it. And ultimately what will happen is our voice will become somewhat tired and somewhat redundant and somewhat predictable. And that will be that. And 20 years from now, we'll all meet on a panel at the Aspen Comedy <laughs> Festival and we'll be real old. Exactly. And the new comedy satire guy will interview us yes. for a little segment on HBO, which by then will be TV, even though it's yes. not TV now. No, and know. that'll be that. And, and, but that, that's not the measure of of your life and that's not the measure of it is to be proud of of what you're doing and to work with people that you enjoy working with for as long as you can do it joining us from washington dan pfeiffer he is a contributor to cnn he was a former senior advisor to president obama on strategy and communications in new york ken a letter he is a contributor to the new yorker magazine where he writes the annals of communication column also at the table, Brooke Gladstone. She is a host and managing editor of, N of WNYC's On the Media. And Dave Itzkoff, a cultural reporter for The New York Times. Also here, Bill Carter, a CNN contributor, author of The War for Late Night, and for years, a media observer for The New York Times. I'm pleased to have all of them on this program. What's the significance of what John Stewart brought to us? I mean, there's so many. I mean, he helped get rid of Crossfire on CNN. It was good. A big, big plus. He shamed Jim Cramer. A yeah. big plus. Okay. Uh, he got Obama on his show seven times. Yeah, thanks to and he made, he made it, probably. He made us laugh, but, but not just at the jokes, but ourselves as well. Uh, I think he's a, a significant Okay, figure. so tell me the truth. Is it what he did about Fox some of the most pleasing aspects for you? Oh, yeah. No, I, I thought the Fox thing was just great. And, and talk about bloviators and, and, and holding him up. And, and when they attacked him, as they did recently, Howie Kurtz, uh, he didn't get defensive. Brooke? Um. Well, I think what's particularly interesting is that uh, there was a, a Reuters Ipsos poll in May yeah. that had the question, does Jon Stewart reflect your view of the world? And 51% of the respondents, or 52%, said, yes, he does. And that's of the of the 1,500. But of Republicans, it was 40% of Republicans. Is it an attitude he has 
uh, rather than an ideology he has. Exactly, and that's where the significance comes in. Uh, we all know about the 2009 poll where he was voted most trusted newsman <laughs> in America, uh, displacing a famous 1970s poll with Walter Cronkite. Okay. And why is that? It's because the the digital world has changed the role of the person presenting information. Is no longer the voice of God from the clouds. He's on your level. The playing field is leveled. As uh, David Weinberger, who's kind of an internet visionary, said, transparency is the new, you know, authenticity. That's what you trust. Not, not authority. Not uh, objectivity, which everybody knows is a bit of a myth. So it's, so it's trans transparency and authenticity. Well, transparency is the new objectivity. Uh, uh, it's replaced <clears throat> objectivity as a generator of trust. Carter. Look, he was honest. What he was doing was honest. He came out and said what he thought, but he also backed it up. He, nobody did more research than that show. I mean, other media outlets were embarrassed all the time because he found things no one else could find. His staff would find a clip. A person would come out and say something, something on Fox News or a politician, and then he'd say, oh, yeah, well, here's what you said five years ago. The exact opposite, and, he, and they would find that he, was, he would be able to, you know, honestly portray a person and hold them to account. And it Yes, of course he had an ideological voice. His point of view was very important. He had a point of view. A lot of times in late night, they try to sort of obscure their point of view. He didn't do that. If he had a passion on a, on a subject, he showed it. But it was really honest. Dave? Yeah, I think part of the pleasure has just been watching that viewpoint evolve over a 16-year period. I can remember the show debuting in 1999, and it was, you know, he had inherited it from Craig Kilborn, and it was kind of, a, you know, maybe a watered-down uh, Saturday Night Live weekend update kind of a show. And, and through, you know, really world events shaping a perspective, you had... The 2000 recount, you had the events of 9-11, you had the crossfire appearance in, uh, in 2004, you've had, you know, the last, uh, you know, five years of, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, political uh, turnover and uh, racial issues coming to the fore. I mean, I think John Stewart is somebody who came by his perspective honestly, and that's what's really di uh, dictated the show. Before we go to Washington and Dan Pfeiffer, take a look at this is a clip uh, having to do with crossfire. Here it is. It's funny, you know, and I... And I I made a special effort to come on the show today because I have uh, privately amongst my friends and also in occasional newspapers and television shows <laughs> mentioned uh, this show as being uh, uh, bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, well, noticed. And, and I wanted to, I felt that that wasn't fair and I should come here and, and tell you that I don't, it's not so much that it's bad as it's hurting America. <laughs> So I, I wanted to but come here today defense, let me, and say, uh, wait, wait, no, I just, no, let me, here, here, here's just one, what I wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> stop, 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 stop hurting America. Okay, now. Let me, and and let come me work you. for us because we, as the people. How do you pay? The people, not, not well. Better than CNN, I'm sure. But you can sleep at night. See, the, the, the thing is, we need your, your help. You're, right now, you're helping the politicians and the, 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 the corporations, and we're left out Wait, there to mow them, our lawns. You just lawns. said we're too rough on them when they make mistakes. No, 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 you're not too rough on them. You're part of their strategies. You're partisan, um, what do you call it, uh, hacks. <laughs> well, was that the end of Crossfire? <laughs> well, actually, Shortly a couple months after. later, uh, <laughs> Mr. Klein, who was the head of CNN, Definitely. announced that I agree with John Stewart, Goodbye. and we're ending... The show right. then came back under That's under right. Zucker oh, yeah. well, for, for brief another yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So Dan Pfeiffer, the president, appeared what seven or eight times? Seven times, seven times in his life, and three times as president. Um, why was it good for the president of the United States to go on John Stewart? <clears throat> Well, I think, well, first, John Stewart embodies two things that have happened over the course of his 16 years. The first is the sort of digitalization of the news, because John Stewart's influence was not just what people saw if they were watching Comedy Central at night. It was in the clips that were shared on Facebook and Twitter of his very, you know, the various things he would do. And also, he came of age at the exact time when our politics and the media were getting incredibly absurd. And he pointed that out in a way no one else would, which is why... So many people, particularly the young people who were an important part of Obama's coalition, watched. And so if you're going to communicate with young people in America, you have to talk to John Stewart. And John Stewart became someone not so important and influential that we would, the president would just go on a show. Someone the president would call into the Oval Office and talk to, just as he would do 
you know, the the anchors of the, you know, the network news, because um, that was a voice that really mattered, and probably more so in some ways than, you know, your traditional newsreader anchor, because he would carry that point of view, whether it was getting the 9-11 workers bill passed or like he was beating the president up nonstop about healthcare.gov. And we were very concerned okay. that John Stewart would turn people off from it. Beyond the fact that he wanted mm -hmm. to reach his audience, mm -hmm. uh, did he want to learn something from John Stewart? Look, the president has tremendous respect for John Stewart as a entertainer, as a personality, as someone who's incredibly smart. The president will say that his interviews with John Stewart were some of the toughest he would do, not because in a different way than an interview with you, Charlie, or someone else would be tough, because you never knew where he would go. You know, in 2012, we did interviews with all the network news anchors, Brian Williams, Scott Pelley, Diane Sawyer, and the only person in that entire campaign who asked the president about drones was John Stewart. Like, he, he, didn't, he would think about things that were not just sort of the immediate Politico fiasco of the day. And that made it hard to prepare for because you never knew where he was going to go. Now, let me go to that. John Stewart as an interviewer, Ken. I think one of the things that, that enthralled me about him um, and I think enthralled the audience is that there was a sense of, of danger on his show. You didn't know what he was going to do, that, that, picking up on, on that last point. I think they knew what he was going to do there. No, no, but, they, but I people... I Kramer knew. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. <laughs> they didn't know what he was going to do. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, you're sitting there you're kind of tense and yet you're kind of curious. I was reminded of his uh, first interview with Rick Santorum which uh, was a great disappointment. It seemed so conventional. There were no difficult questions asked. You know, afterwards, I, I turned to my husband and I said, boy, he just rolled over on that one. And then the next day, Jon Stewart came back and said, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback on my interview with Rick Santorum. Uh, some people said it sucked, and some people <laughs> said it sucked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, and the thing is, is uh, who does that? Only that's the transparency you were yes, talking about. Exactly. Precisely. And, and precisely. he had the same feeling about Rumsfeld. He went back years later and said, I, I missed on that, and I have regretted it every day since. I mean, he, he felt like he had sort of an obligation to that audience. He would make fun of the fact that people should not trust him as the newsman. But he took it seriously. He knew that audience was paying attention to what he said, that young audience, and he was responsible. He yeah, wanted to uh, really do even, what they expected. Even the way that he sort of handled his exit, these kind of retrospective clip packages that they've been showing these last few weeks, they're always self-deprecating. It's always, you know, making fun of how bad his singing voice was or what yeah, a bad yeah. job he did in his celebrity well, interviews. Yeah, but, you know, he would, would deny up and down that he was a journalist. I, I was at an event, a stage event with him, and I said, you know, what you're doing really is journalism. He said, no, it's it's not. Uh, now, how long ago was that? Like it was after the Hurricane Sandy, uh -huh. not that long ago. And and I said, but you're not any different, really, from Thomas Nast or or Mark Twain or Will Rogers or people like that. You are a satirist, but also you have journalism in your bones. And he just said, no, I'm a comedian. And he would really, really emphasize that all the time. That's what I am. I'm a comic. Uh, did it have an impact, Dan, when he was critical of the president, which he, he felt necessary to point out to his audience uh, uh, several days ago because he had been <laughs> criticized for rolling over on some issue? We feared his criticism because it, w it had a more influence than a somewhat a more traditional journalist or a journalist, if you will, was doing it. And, you know, particularly, you know, that his first interview um, that Dave recounts in the New York Times the other day, it was one where we went into it with high hopes to try, it was right before the midterm elections, hopefully young people would watch it and get fired up. And he kind of skewered the president. And the sort of the stories that came out of that was, you know, Obama's lost his liberal base because John Stewart was so tough to him. And that hurt. Um, you know, he was an influential voice. And when he's for you, that's great. And when he's not, that's a huge problem. Was there anything worse than the Sebelius interview where he, exactly. I mean, he basically yeah. just said this is a disaster in a very funny way yeah. by saying yeah. I'll download every movie of all it, time and, <laughs> and you download, we'll see who's first. Yeah. I mean, and it basically that because he did, the Republicans were hitting him for it. But when he did, it was like this thing is a disaster. Yeah. Everybody accepted it. <laughs> Dan, let me just go back to what did he talk to the, what did the president talk to John about? Well, I, you know, I wasn't in the room for it. The president kicked all the staff out for it, as, ah. which is a sign, which is a sign of respect for uh, for John Stewart. Um, but I know the genesis of it was, you know, one of them was certainly around the time when healthcare.gov was happening, and our big concern was it's not that Stewart was wrong about it, but he was continuing to hammer us after even it was fixed, and we were worried that young people 
who would get their news from Stewart wouldn't actually sign up for health care because they would think it was still broken. Now, and you mentioned the Sebelius interview, which goes exactly to the danger of Stewart. Um, you know, it could it you could go in there and it'd be a fine interview and you make some jokes and you say some things or he can take you down. I worked for Tom Daschle many years ago, long before same sex marriage was a issue that, you know, the country had moved on. And Tom Daschle was a Democratic leader and he went in there. Um, right during the debate around the, same, the constitutional amendment on marriage. And John Stewart skewered him and pushed him really hard as to why would it be wrong if <clears throat> a man, and, you know, if, why would it be wrong for same-sex marriage and pushed him really hard and called him out before any journalist, anyone else was doing that. And you just never knew when that was going to happen. So why is he leaving? I don't think anybody knows exactly. I think uh, he certainly got to scratch an itch uh, when he made right when he made Rosewater, uh, and he certainly has expressed the idea just of wanting to spend you know a little more time with his family. But it's unthinkable that he's going to just you know ride off into the Most sunset. People, you know? When they say yeah. in, in any endeavor they want to spend more time with the family they've usually been fired right, yeah, right. but but, but in, yeah, in john's exactly. case it was actually i i, mean, I absolutely believed it. i i interviewed him one night he was doing the oscars i was in la and i interviewed was him. not a big deal it was not a big success no it wasn't a big success but the, he he was in his dressing room and i was interviewing him and, and it was on the west coast and he looked at his watch and he said oh it's it's bedtime and he said, excuse me for a minute and he got on the phone and he told stories to his two little children yeah. on the phone and I thought this guy's very involved yeah. with his family so when he announced this I thought you know that's credible to me he said I, I, I'm never home for dinner with those kids and they're young I want to do it for a while he, he'll find another outlet but well, I think let, he well let's raise that question I mean, what will he do next because there are some people who believe you find one show that is so you and, and yes. David Letterman the show he does Ted Koppel the show he did uh, John Stewart and that show, yeah. you become so part of it. That is your show. Yeah. You have found the show. But That's, sometimes you get tired of doing it. Well, he, I, I could and, imagine and, and like, you know, or, that, that he felt spent. He himself said when he made his announcement, you don't need a, you know, yeah, you know a, yeah, a yeah, flagging yeah. host. Yeah. You need you need one that's yeah. 100%. He was sure tired. He was you know, tired yeah. of I interviewed him yeah. right as he was taking this job. Right. And he said, you know, people ask me, you know, uh, do I feel that I, you know, ever accomplished anything up until now in his career, before he took over The Daily Show, did I, you know, what did I feel really good about? And I first I thought nothing, and then I thought, yes, there is something I feel great about. I left Jersey, I came to New York, I became a comedian, and I got to express mm -hmm. myself. And he said that before yeah. The Daily Show, and, and maybe he's done what what he can do but maybe he's say, just yeah. run out well, of string he, but i would say he, he he's tired but he does say i'll life. never have another i know i'll never have another That's job right. like this That's he know he acknowledges show. that as you point out yeah. this is the thing for him it's a defining thing and he's not going to have this outlet again he knows that but he, I think he's spent. He's he's done it. But and also, yeah. to go back to the transparency Coming right point, at you, Dan. You could believe that he's the guy who'd be comfortable no matter what he does, because he's comfortable in his own skin. Yeah, and that comes through the, the TV. Dan, what's interesting about all of the late night uh, arena for me <laughs> is how much of it is about politics. I right. mean, politics is the daily fodder of late night television. I mean, you would think there'd be more. That there would be more people like, not just doing what John did so brilliantly, but more political satire. Dan? Well, I, I think that there will, the Internet will breed not a thousand John Stewarts, but a lot of people doing what John Stewart did. Um, not as well, I'm sure. But just to give you a sense of how influential late night comedy is in, in politics, is that in the White House you get clips every day um, that you know run through the news, what was on the TV news. About three or four years ago, we started pulling all the late night comedy clips to see the monologues, to see what was driving public opinion. Because if it, if something happens and it, you know, it may like make a, a short mention on the on the nightly news, but if it's getting hammered every night by Stewart or Fallon or Leno or whoever, all of a sudden people start to know about it pretty quickly. So we began to monitor that to see like where public opinion was going, which I think just speaks the fact that the White House looks every day at what was on the late night comedy shows like how influential that has become as media is sort of disaggregated. And, you know, when there's been there's people trust the media less, these comedians become more powerful.
Don't you think that the late night shows have actually gotten less political? I mean, the network uh, shows that the you know Fallon and uh, you, you know Fallon just, just gets yeah, comedian. Yeah. But all, right. and, and he'll Kimmel, do a couple right. of jokes. But they'll do their yeah. monologues have become sort of the, almost the least important component of those shows yes. now. And, but I think it's a presidential yeah. election year. We'll see what happens. I sure. do think the, the what the monologues do, and, and this is what interesting that Dan's pointing that out in the White House that they create the narrative. Like there's a narrative for what happened, and 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 if the all the comedians are going after that narrative. It reinforces it, and the country it starts to really sink in. In the country, the interesting thing about Obama, I think, is that he's never been identified in a way as what's his comic thing. I mean, you know, you know, Clinton was a hound, and you know, and 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 was Bush was, you know, like yeah, a hound. I guess is the right word. And, and Bush knows that's that a better word, yeah. right? And, and and Bush was kind of a dope. They would anything he did. Was, but but Obama doesn't have. He's aloof. How do you? You know, that's his thing. It, it's He's been harder for them to define, I think, and that's one of the reasons it, there hasn't been quite as much, I think. Well, Obama, do you agree with that, Dan? I, I do. I, th I mean, part of it is, you know, we've been fortunate not to have that idea hammered into the public every night on every comedy show, but this will give you another sense of how important it is. I mean, this is off forgotten because it's 100 years ago now, but... In 2007, when the president was running against Hillary Clinton, we were desperately looking for ways to draw a contrast with her. And one of the ways we found to do it was the president had a guest appearance on Saturday Night Live yep. where he got to take a sort of a pop at her. And <laughs> that, to the extent that things could go viral back in 2007, that went viral. And that was worth more, way more than the time it took to go to New York to do it. And so I think the presidential election will determine whether, you know, how much politics and comedy will stay intertwined yeah. because it was a huge part in the last two presidential elections. And if Donald Trump's yeah. the nominee, I can guarantee you it will be this one. Well, yeah. <laughs> what David Letterman said, the one reason he regretted leaving is because of Donald Trump. <laughs> so what, what do you think he's going to do now, John Stewart? I have no idea. Yeah, I, don't I, I mean, I, no I know I'll see him at Met Games yeah. he's in, <laughs> with his kids. <laughs> with his kids. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I think he'll be comfortable doing that for a while. But I, I have no idea. I don't think do John is, knows. I, but, you know, it was interesting. He showed up at a comedy club last two weeks ago, just for, did 10 minutes of stand up, just showed up. That's in his bloodstream. So you're going to I think he's going to probably do a little more of that and then figure out maybe another movie or something. I, he'll do something substantial. The guy is so bright. I think he'll do something really substantial. Yeah, I thought I thought when he made Rosewater, that was a real curveball. I mean, that was a story of real substance. Because he said whether he wants to make another film or, I wonder, or he I mean, enjoy it, the experience that I did, much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, and it took yeah. it really took some doing, I think, for him to get the arrangement with Comedy Central to even get the time off to make that film. I think now that he has a completely, you know, clear uh, schedule of, of, you know, an infinite canvas to play with, I, th I wonder if he's going to look for more more of those kinds of stories that he can really help bring uh, attention to and bring a lens to. Late Night continues to fascinate. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Brooke. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Great Thank to you. have you. Bill, good to see you again. Great to see you, Charlie. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.